welcome everyone uh, to the Global History of HIV, brought to you by the History Department, the Clio Society, and the College of Arts and Sciences at The Ohio State University, as well as by the Bexley Public Library. My name is Nick Breifogel, and I'm an Associate Professor of History, and I'll be your host and moderator today. Thank you so very much for joining us. Today is, as the screen behind me says, World AIDS Day, December 1st, uh, and uh, on this day and in the midst of, uh, of another pandemic, uh, we welcome Professor Thomas McDowell, who will look closely at the historical factors that shaped the global spread of HIV from equatorial Africa to the world. Let's get to know our speaker. Uh, professor Thomas McDowell is an Associate Professor of History at Ohio State University, who specializes in the history of Africa and the Indian Ocean. He's the author of Buying Time, Debt and Mobility in the Western Indian Ocean, and he earned his PhD at Yale University. Professor McDowell's current research is on the history of HIV AIDS in Tanzania, with a focus on African scientists and society. This new project and his lecture today both grow out of his innovative teaching. In cooperation with Jesse Quick, a virologist, Professor McDowell developed and teaches two popular courses on HIV that are cross-listed between the history and microbiology departments. The first is a large lecture course entitled HIV, From Microbiology to Macro History, offered each spring. And the second is a month-long study abroad course in East Africa called HIV in Context, Tanzania. With that introduction, let me mention the plan today. Professor McDowell will offer a short overview of the long history of HIV, and then he'll take your questions uh, and we'll open up things for discussion. If you're interested in asking a question, please write it in the, the Q&A or the question and answer function at the bottom of your screen on Zoom. And we'll do our best to get through all the questions that come our way. Now, without further ado, let me pass you over to Professor Thomas McDowell, who will take us on an exploration of the global history of HIV. Professor McDowell. Thank you so much, Nick, um, for hosting. Uh, thank you to the ASC and the CLIO Society and the Bexley Library for making this event possible. I'm delighted to be here today and to help us think about um, what we celebrate and remember on World AIDS Day. So uh, I've got some slides to share to help tell the story and help us think about this moment. So let me let me start those up. So we, we, we're together today in the Zoom space in part because we're living in the midst of a, a pandemic of uh, COVID-19, uh, so which is, it puts us in mind to think about the AIDS pandemic and the way that that has affected the world. So I just, just for comparative, comparative purposes, I've, I have you know, some things for us to think about. And, part, and one of them is that we are in celebrating and acknowledging World AIDS Day, we are thinking about and recalling the 38, the 32.7 million people who've died from HIV and its related illnesses in the nearly last 40 years. Um, this, is, this is a huge number. Um, and even last year, in, in, we live in a, a world where AIDS, there are medicines which make it possible to treat HIV uh, but not cure it, uh, but still there were 690,000 people who, who died of HIV last year. Thinking about COVID and its impact, we see, a, we see also a devastating, a devastating disease. And there are, I'm sure in the Q&A, we can talk about some of the comparisons or lessons learned or those, those kind of things. Today, I wanna to focus more narrowly on the history of HIV and help us think about it in a global context. Uh, this is in the level of PSA as a professor who gets to speak in front of people, I want to make sure we all know what we're talking about, that HIV is the human immunodeficiency virus, and it causes uh, in the, the acquired immunodeficiency syndrome, or known as, known as AIDS. Um, to, to be clear about the way that it's spread, uh, and that also a, a point that was controversial at some, at some time, that HIV, the virus, causes AIDS. And the effect of the disease is to take over your immune system and dismantle it, turning turning your um, turning your immune system into a system that creates that re replicates the virus and um, decimates your ability to fight off diseases. 
A key aspect of HIV is that it takes five to 10 years after infection for it to begin to affect a person. Um, and that, but then once that begins without treatment, um, people will die of, the, of opportunistic infections that your immune system would otherwise fight off. And as I mentioned, there are drugs available today and we've made incredible progress both in developing these drugs and getting them out broadly. But as I noted before, there's still hundreds of thousands of people die every year from AIDS-related illnesses. I say there's no cure. If you read the newspapers closely or follow the scientific literature, you'll know that there have been two people who have been cured of AIDS, uh, but that has, has been through a very unusual process of um, bone marrow replacement and, uh, and um, genetic and genetic uh, genetic set of predispositions which make it make it extremely expensive, highly um, dangerous and, and thus not able to be rolled out widely. So an, an area still of development. But so what my questions today are what can we learn from the thinking about the history of AIDS and HIV? And many of the audience maybe already has some idea about this. You might have some associations, especially from, from the 1980s about Freddie Mercury or Magic Johnson um, acknowledging their, that they had, had AIDS or of, of Ryan White, the Indiana teenager who captured the world's attention, um, of Rock Hudson, um, but also of protest and of, of the anger at the, gov the slow-footed government response to this. Um, and you know, from this history of HIV, um, when we think about that in the United States, there are things that we can, we can take from that and that we can understand. Um, certainly the stigmatization of the groups that were most affected and the people who, the groups that had the highest le levels of AIDS when it, uh, in the early 1980s. Um, but that also led to greater visibility um, for, for these groups, both for, for good and for, for ill. Um, the number of people who suffered, the discrimination that came up around this, these are part of the American story. Um, also, this, you know, Ronald Reagan didn't mention AIDS in public until 1987, um, and Bush also, and even Clinton's records are, are uneven on this. So, you know, and how this echoed into the culture wars of the, of the time. Um, we saw a slide of protests and the way that protests drove, um, drove drug discovery, put pressure on scientists and funding agencies um, and, uh, to, to make changes. Uh, which did, you know, was happening at the same time, a number of amazing scientific breakthroughs and discoveries, both of understanding the virus and its replication process, but also to develop drugs, develop new drugs, and to adapt old drugs to uh, make it possible to treat HIV um, and develop and to the point of developing a multi-drug cocktail, which could efficiently suppress the viral load, the virus that, that people carried in them, and make that both undetectable and untransmissible. Um, and also the process of memorialization. Many of you may know about the AIDS quilt that, that people made squares of to commemorate and remember loved ones who had died from, from AIDS. Um, and also this a day like today when we have a chance to think about AIDS in, in, in the world and what has happened from that. Um, so, but my question is this from an American point of view, but what, what do we get when we step back and, and look, take a global view? And so I'm a historian of Africa. And so I'm gonna take us to think about African history and HIV and also the surprising factors that led to its global spread where we'll have to dive into the Cold War and its politics. And we'll even get Nelson Mandela out of prison. So in 2007, this is a map of global prevalence of HIV in 2017. Um, and if you'll notice that in, in Africa and especially equatorial, eastern and southern Africa, the burden of disease and the prevalence of HIV is much, much higher than other places in the world. Um, so that's important, important to keep in mind, this, this um, uneven burden of the disease and also it's, it's spread into all countries of the world and the way that, they're, that every place has been touched by, by HIV, but that Africa has had most suffering and the greatest um, burden of the disease. So uh, in 2018, 67.8% of all people who were HIV positive lived in Africa. Uh, and, and the epidemic there 
if there is, if we could say a single epidemic or different epidemics, overlapping epidemics of HIV look quite different than you might, than way, the way you might imagine HIV from the US perspective. First of all, most more women than men are infected and that the primary mode of transmission is uh, um, heterosexual, heterosexual contact. Um, but although there are, um, there are epidemic or there are uh, spread by injection, injection, injection drug use, mother to child transmission, and also by men having sex with men. Um, and so if we want to understand this question of why has HIV disproportionately affected Africans, the most important one, again, we're thinking historically is time. Um, and that, that, that the disease first crossed over into humans in Africa um, and it turns out that was a long time ago. Um, and so there's a greater degree of, of exposure. Uh, and so in a longer time that for it to move around before we had a sense of what it was. Um, but then also the structural pieces of the global economy and that made it difficult or that some parties were unwilling to get ARVs, antiretroviral drugs to Sub-Saharan Africa until, until quite late, almost 10 years after they were available in other parts of the world. So that's that's the a bigger picture, but I want to I want to zoom in and think a little bit about when and where the virus emerged in, in humans and how we might understand that, and then think about how HIV became a global disease. So that's our our focus today is to understand where HIV came from and how it became a global disease. And it turns out, you know, we're, again, I'm a historian, in, and I I tell my students if you're ever trapped in an elevator with a historian just ask them, what are their sources, right? What is your archive that you use? And they'll get so excited and they'll be able to keep talking and you can, you can, you know, mind your own business at that point. Um, but so when we think about how would we, how do we reconstruct and understand the history of HIV, a certain, certainly, you know, the, the emergence of the disease, the first cases were recorded in 1981 or noticed in 1981, but it turns out there's a deeper prehistory of the virus that we can, we can think about. And that the way of understanding that comes from the virus itself. We can look at viral replication cycles and genetic variation and mutation within the virus to put things together. And it turns out that two samples that were taken, one in 1959 and one in 1960, which were called ZR59 and DRC60, um, those samples that were taken and put in and stored in a lab for someone, for someone with a, other, other conditions scientists were able to go back and, and um, recreate the viral RNA in those, in those samples and understand them and then compare them to each other and put them in a family tree to trace back the most common recent ancestor. And so in doing that, it turns out that, that HIV is much older than it was initially believed. You know, I've, you know, many, if I don't know what your own ideas of when HIV emerged or when it was a first, first, um, the first humans contracted HIV, um, but that when we go back and use the a set of very complicated uh, equations and work by Michael Warobi, um, who's at the University of Arizona, um, we, see, we see that the, that the dates are, you know, between in the first decade of the, of the 20th century or, this, or, the early, or the early 1920s, that uh, the moment when HIV emerged, emerged in humans. And again, this is a phylogenetic analysis that just moves backwards from the, from the genetic similarities to figure out what was the most common recent ancestor of these, of these two samples. So those samples from 1959 and 1960 taken in Leopoldville or then Kinshasa in the, what's now the Democratic Republic of Congo have helped us unlock this, this history. So now we knew when it happened, but how do we know where and how, and how that transfer occurred? And, and essentially, in the, the, pink, the pink circle that you see here on this map um, is, is the place that, that scientists were able to determine that chimpanzees, the chimpanzees who live in that region of the Sangha River, have, uh, the, have carry a simian immunodeficiency virus, which is closely, is the closest relative we could find to the human immunodeficiency virus. Um, and chimpanzees, it turns out, don't cross rivers. And so actually, um, as Beatrice Hahn and her graduate students collected over across equatorial Africa, collected um, monkey scat and, and used that to recreate the virus, the simian immunodeficiency virus, and then determine where the most likely place that that happened. So this, 
is in the southeast corner of Cameroon um, along the Sangha, the Sangha River. And the hypothesis is that blood to blood contact between a, a hunter who was hunting chimpanzees, um, then cut him, cut him or herself, and then the blood that their bloods mixed and in the human blood, the simian immunodeficiency virus or SIV transformed into HIV. Um, but one incident, and there are other forms of HIV that are out there, other that come from other primates um, that we that we can track, and they've been they've been named. Um, but from one um, instance of zoonotic transfer, how then can we get a global pandemic? How can, how can we have a disease that would reach out across the globe and kill more than 32 million people and have 38 million people living with the disease today? So that's part of what I wanted to talk about. Because this happened, if we look at, think about the first decade of the 20th century, we're talking, we're talking about a period that some of you might know from your studies of literature and the heart of darkness of colonial exploitation of the Congo River watershed and movements in that, in that area. Uh, a time when steamboats and paddle boats um, took, came on the, on the Congo, Congo River to make it easier to move around, to move out the hard timbers, the ivory and the rubber that were being taken from the Congo River watershed. Um, but also meant greater mobility for African people. So perhaps our cut hunter uh, moved down the river or moved through this riverine system. Um, but what we know is that by 1959 or 1960, in Kinshasa, which were the arrow points, which is, was the called known as Leopoldville in the colonial Belgian Congo, that we have someone who had the virus in their blood and was remained, remained in a tissue sample. So this process of, of amplifying the virus, we think happens through migration, through the growth of cities and the demand for labor in colonial cities, but also through colonial medicine and interventions to try to stop things like sleeping sickness or, or yaws um, and other things where, uh, and also um, immunization um, campaigns, which resulted in you know, the reuse of needles um, and also in um, clinics for sexually transmitted infections where people were, were required to come in for treatment, but that also in giving treatments, the colonial medical officers reused, reused the same needles in, with various, various people. So there's a way that this amplification happens in this, in this colonial period. Um, here, you know, again, in, in Kinshasa or, or Leopoldville in the late 1950s, here are just two pictures of, sort of everyday life um, and you know, the, the, the world that, that people inhabit. Um, and so, you know, do, were one of these people carrying around uh, this virus that, you know, very few people in the world had at that time, again, with a five to 10 year delay between, between infection and onset of sy sy symptoms, it would be hard for someone to understand what had happened or to make that connection. Um, but if we want to move then from, from Leopoldville and the colonial Congo, how can how can HIV become a global disease? Uh, and to do to understand that, we need to think about the context of African decolonization and the Cold War. Because the first sample that we talked about, um, ZR59, was taken during in the Belgian Congo. By 1960, the Belgian Congo became the Democratic Republic of Congo. It was an independent nation. Um, and the and but Belgian decolonization set in motion a set of contingencies which resulted in HIV spreading around the world. Um, here we have the end of June 1930 when the Belgian king uh, arrives to hand over power and to complete the decolonization of the Congo with Patrice Lumumba, who was the prime minister elect on the left and Joseph Kasavubu, who was the president elect in the center. Um, the, Belgian, the Belgian decolonization had been quite hasty. In 1955, someone who, a political scientist in Belgium who had suggested that the decolonization of the Congo could happen in the next 30 years was laughed out of the room for being, for being um, far too liberal. It would take much longer than that. But with the global winds of change and, that were happening and the push for decolonization, uh, Belgian, Belgium decolonizing and granted independence in the Congo very quickly. Um, so that happened in 1960, but also with very few preparations, few civil servants. Um, there, there were not a, a developed governmental structure or people to man those, those situations. But also it happened within the context of a global cold and the Congo was 
rich in minerals, including and, and other mining wealth, and also as a source of uranium. Some of the uranium, in fact, that had been used in the Second World War for the atomic bomb that were dropped in Japan. And so quickly after the independence of the Congo, um, the Cold War context came caused great difficulty in, in the Congo. Lumumba was seen as not sufficiently loyal or, or interested in, in Western and, and um, Western allies and was potentially open to the Soviet Union. Uh, and also the wealth, the mining wealth in, in Congolese pro provinces was considered uh, too valuable to be left to an African government. And so if you see from this timeline, after independence on June 30th, a cascade of events set Congo into crisis, which uh, over the next, the next five years and, and the legacy of that continues to this day, um, which involved the succession of two of one, one region and another part of another region, UN peacekeepers coming in, the, um, the prime minister being assassinated, the UN secretary general dying in the Congo or near the, on the way to the Congo in mysterious circumstances, and ended in a coup in 1965 in which Joseph Mobutu overthrows the government and puts himself into power where he stayed until 1997 uh, as a kind of archetype of the um, Cold War kleptocrat. Um, so we see here the Katanga province uh, and its succession and, and the region of Kasai that left. This is where the mining wealth and the uranium was. Patrice, Patrice Lumumba was assassinated in 1960 with the complicity of the US CIA. Um, there still, people are still trying to get to the bottom of what happened when Dag Hammarskjöld went down in a mysterious plane, when his plane flying in Zambia on the way to Katanga went down. Um, and there's, you, they're great, there's great films and conspiracy theories all around this, um, but mysterious circumstances indeed for the UN Secretary General to be, to be killed. The Congo crisis took up, you know, was, was dominated the news. Here we have the newspaper, the New York Times, the paper of record in the US from March 1st, 1961, three different articles and a picture above the fold about what was happening in the Congo and what, and, and what was going on there. So this was a global story. And, and as we'll see with the story of HIV has global implications. Um, but so how, why, what are these global implications? How did this happen? Well, in fact, it's connected, part of our story, we have to go to the Caribbean and think about the island nation of Haiti. Because in the, in the, in the 1960s, um, Haiti had its own Cold War dictator, Francois Duvalier, known as Papa Doc, who um, ruled Haiti with an iron fist um, and uh, had a secret police that, were, that made it very difficult for intellectuals and others to do well. Uh, I, couldn't help but point out that uh, Duvalier, known as Papa Doc, did study public health at the University of Michigan. So I put a lapel pin on him for that. Um, uh, and, and so it meant that the educated elite and civil servants and others were eager to find things to do outside of Haiti. It turns out in the very same, in the very same New York Times of March 1st, 1961, but back on page 10, there's a little article about 28 Haitian secondary school teachers who were leaving to go uh, work in the Congo. These Haitians were well-educated, they were French speaking, they had a variety of skills that were useful to the Congo in the midst of this crisis and the failure of Belgian decolonization of having um, trained Africans to be to, to take over the, the functioning of government. Um, by 1962, they were the second most represented nation there. And by 1967, there were 4,500 Haitians working in the Congo. So it seems one of these people contracted HIV and carried the virus back with them across the Atlantic to Haiti. So again, using phylogenetic trees and mapping um, from known um, viral samples in, in the US, we, under, we see that sometime between 1963 and 1971, HIV came to Haiti. And then through, whether it's through sex tourism, through blood banking and, and plasma collection that was happening among poor Haitians for it to be used in the United States or other means or the, the movement of one individual that um, HIV um, went, entered New York sometime between 1969 and 1974. Um, and then also made its way 
to California from these from these networks. And so, you know, the first the cases that capture the world's attention were in Los Angeles in 1981, and San Francisco was imagined as or seen as a place where HIV proliferated. Um, but the phylogenetic again using the the virus itself um, and to understand its and using the replication process and mutation process, we can we can trace back and understand how the disease spread in this way. So Haiti um, and the and Haitians rush to fill in the void of Belgian decolonization in the Congo uh, was one of the ways that HIV came to the Western Hemisphere and it came to the United States. But also in the in the broader Cold War context, it's useful to think about. Uh, what else made HIV a global disease? And in this case, we should think about Cuba and its role in the Angola, Angolan Civil War and Angolan fight for independence. Because this was another vector by which HIV came to the Western, Western Hemisphere. So um, Fidel Castro backed Agostino Nieto and his Marxist um, movement for the popular liberation of Angola. Um, and they had begun fighting for independence in 1960. Che Guevara arrived in Angola in 1965 to begin to organize uh, how to support um, how to support the NPLA and what what could happen there. Um, this was the Cold War stakes were high in Angola. Here we have a quote from um, the U.S. Secretary of Defense in 1975 speaking to the National Security Council. He said. We might wish to encourage the disintegration of Angola. Cabinda, you can see the arrow is pointing to this province that connects to it's also where there's oil. Um, in, to have that the, in the clutches of Mobutu, right, in Zaire, the next country up, or the Democratic Republic of Congo, the next country up, um, who was a staunch US ally, would mean far greater security of, of the petroleum resources, right? And so the Cold War stakes there are high. The United States and South Africa backed the UNITA. Um, against the MPLA with the goal of destabilizing and controlling Angola. And this is in the 70s and into the, into the, into the 80s. Um, during this time, a large number of Cubans went to Angola, something like 5% of the overall Cuban population served in Angola, many of them in the military, but also civilians who were teachers and, and, and filled in other teachers and doctors and other roles. So this tremendous presence of, of Cubans to help bring about liberation in Angola and support the MPLA. And it turns out that this, the fight in Angola, this hot war within the Cold War um, set off, set into motion a set of dominoes and changes which ended white supremacy and minority rule in, South, in Southern Africa. South Africa in the, in, during this time was ruled by the apartheid government they also controlled Namibia, which was had been a trust territory after the second after the First World War, um, and, and Rhodesia, and only in 1980 had become Zimbabwe and become independent. But when the MPLA, the Angolan forces, and the Cubans defeated the U.S.-backed UNITA and their South African allies, who were also fighting in 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 Angola in 1988, this forced a peace treaty. Um, the Cubans agreed to leave Angola, but South Africa agreed to pull out of Angola and to pull out of Namibia. Um, this was this connected to a broader set of protests in South Africa and township and Af efforts by Africans to make townships ungovernable under the white supremacist apartheid regime. Um, people refused to serve in the military to go fight in, in, even white South Africans refused to serve in the military to go fight in Namibia or fight in Angola. Um, and so these things, all of these processes and pressures on South Africa led to the freeing of Nelson Mandela after 27 years, years in prison and the beginning of multi-racial uh, multi, uh, elections in South Africa in 1994. Um, and a, a kind of miraculous story. And South Africa has its own, South Africa is the country with the most people living with HIV. And there's a, a whole story there. I, 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 I'm, you should take my class if you wanna hear more. I, I don't have time to tell it all today. Um, but certainly Nelson Mandela considered Castro an ally and a friend because of his efforts to help liberate Southern Africa. Um, you know, whereas uh, the US government under Ronald Reagan called Nelson Mandela, referred to Nelson Mandela as, as a terrorist at the time in the, 19, in the 1980s. So again, these, these Cold War rivalries and divisions um, are part of what is motivating this world and the spread of HIV. Because it was Cuban soldiers and Cuban volunteers 
who, when they returned to Cuba, discovered that they had HIV. Um, and so it's this connection with Angola and their um, attempts or their efforts in liberating um, and, and standing with Marxist allies to, to bring that about also bring, brought HIV to Cuba, a distinct, uh, a distinct epidemic or linkages that are in addition to the Haitian connection um, through the Congo, which brought HIV to the US. Um, and so again, my, the, a takeaway I want you to have from this is the global spread of HIV was came about because of the uh, African decolonization of Africa and also was very much tied to the context of the Cold War and the international rivalries that were taking place at the time. Thank goodness we are at a different place with the disease and the thing and that we can think about in a, di in a different way. AIDS is no longer a death sentence, right? And so the UN AIDS, the UN agency that, that focuses on HIV uh, had a goal for 2020 was that they called 90-90-90. And this depends on antiretrovirals being available and widespread testing. And the goal was for 90% of those people who had HIV to know their status, 90% of those people who know their status to be on antiretroviral treatment, and 90% of those people to be on antiretroviral treatment long enough and consistently enough to suppress their viral load. If you're taking antiretroviral drugs and you suppress your viral load, it is impossible to transmit the virus any further. Uh, and so these goals, the, the world will not make them exactly, uh, or many Cape nations have fallen short of their individual goals for to meet the 90, 90, 90 goals. But this makes a tremendous, we, we moved a tremendous way from the 1980s when, when AIDS was a death sentence, that everyone who contracted the disease would die from it. Um, so I, I, I'm gonna stop there and move to questions. Um, because you know this 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 is a small part of the story of the history of AIDS and of HIV, um, and that we can stop to acknowledge on this day on World AIDS Day, um, because when we when we stop to acknowledge World World AIDS Day, we pause to reflect on millions of lives cut short. We pause to think about the immense suffering that that people have gone through as they've been affected by this disease. And we also must, and what I'm hoping to help, help you do today is to acknowledge the global history of HIV and the complex interconnected world that we inhabit. A world that makes it possible for zoonotic transfer to occur as we push against environments and change the way that we do things, the human-centered um, world, uh, but also a world that in its, in, in its interconnections that we might underestimate show us how connected the world is and also the possibility in the world for our to address disease, both as, as through medic, medical interventions, but also human interventions to decrease stigma and, and find acceptance for those who are infected. So um, thank you so much for uh, tuning in to this talk and to understand one part of the global history of HIV. I'm very much happy to take your questions. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Dory. This is so really, really appreciated. This was an incredible, uh, I mean, it was a lot in 30 minutes. That was a great explanation to take us through all of these different kinds of connections. And it's a great reminder of the ways in which um, uh, the stories of the history of, the, of disease and the human experience of disease is often tremendously complex and has very, very deep roots. Uh, I would be, I'd be curious if you'd taken a quiz, how many people would have known uh, the fact that uh, you know the that HIV goes back basically you know over a century uh, it's quite remarkable that way um, we uh, yeah let's take some questions now we had uh, some questions submitted uh, in advance we also have some that are up here uh, at the moment let me take a couple that have just come in kind of in real time um, one uh, one of our people in the audience wants to know uh, what accounts for more women. Sorry, what accounts for more women uh, than men having a, uh, having AIDS in Africa? Um, I don't know if you can explain that. I think particularly coming from the American perspective, where the associations, rightly or wrongly, are the opposite. Uh, right. Can you tell us the story there? And this, I mean, yes. Again, so one of the challenges is our own perception of, uh, from an American point of view, of of who is who has. 
who has HIV and is likely to get to get AIDS. Uh, again, in the African context, uh, you know there are more more women than men, uh, and that the predominant form of transmission has been heterosexual contact. It turns out that there are a few things that are protective of HIV, and um, and one of them is decision. Uh, and so the and this was people thought about this uh, from just for what they saw result of it, of areas of central or eastern and southern Africa where people traditionally circumcised tended to have lower rates of HIV among among men. It means. That, um, but then in the, in the 1990s, a set of randomized control trials um, done in Kenya and South Africa um, showed that in fact, this was the case and that male circumcision is something like 65% protective against for, for men contracting HIV. Um, of course, if, people, if you don't contract HIV, you can't spread HIV. Uh, and so in the, in the early 2000s, there was a great rollout of voluntary, what they called voluntary male medical circumcision to increase the number of, of men who were circumcised and thus to reduce, reduce the transmission of HIV. Um, so that's part of the, that's one of the reasons that men have less HIV, but also uh, the vaginal secretions and tissue um, are a place that HIV is um, more, is it more easily enters the system. And so that, you know, that the fact that women are more susceptible to HIV uh, is something that we often lose, again, from the American point of view, we, lo we lose sight of. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Um, we have someone else who's interested in, in uh, if, you could, if you can, speak to, uh, to the impact of the work being done by, by the Gates Foundation or the Clinton Foundation in terms of their, their work with HIV and AIDS. Right. And so the, the philanthropic aspect of global HIV is a fascinating one. Um, at, at one level, if we, if we step back and think about it in, in global trends, we have to see the erosion of trust in multilateral organizations like the World Health Organization and, and, the, and, and distrust of the UN bureaucracy and its ways of addressing things and the ways that during, um, at the end of the Cold War and the, the rise of a kind of um, neoliberal governance or the, an American Washington consensus on how the world should be run, that, uh, that the faith in the UN systems and, and the WHO were going down. At the same time, we saw a rise of private philanthropic foundations like the Clinton um, Foundation and the Gates Foundation, which saw it as, as that they could step in and make, make a big difference, make a big difference here. So those, um, those organizations have, I mean, the Clinton Foundation was key in um, rolling out um, or, or negotiating prices to make antiretrovirals more readily available in, in, in Africa and other, in other places by using generics. Again, disrupting a, um, disrupting a pattern by which the pharmaceutical companies uh, using intellectual property were blocking the spread of, or, or blocking the spread of generic drugs, more easily affordable generic drugs. And so the Clinton Foundation was huge in that. The Gates Foundation has been uh, tremendous in its fostering research and understanding and helping to set a global um, agenda. In 2001, when the Global Fund for, HA, for, for AIDS, tuberculosis, and malaria was started, uh, which you know, the idea was we needed a much greater emphasis, the globe needed a much greater emphasis if we were going to do, be able to do anything about these diseases. The US initially agreed to, to kick in $200 million. Bill Gates agreed to kick in $100 million. So we see that, that uh, the role of foundations and, and philanthropic the philanthropic role has has empowered and and strengthened this the approach, um, but critics would also say it's also made the process less democratic and and less involved governments less and less. And so, in terms of who gets to make these decisions and where are these made, it's not always at deliberative bodies in Geneva or UN connected things, but sometimes around conference tables in Redmond, Washington, right, to, 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 to boil it down. And so, you know, that, that we can, as scholars, we can, we can approach this role of philanthropy and see, one, the incredible contributions they've made and, and the way that it's made possible to, for this, the, our great successes against HIV. We can also see shortcomings and the way that they could be 
more democratic or the way the, the agenda setting process comes into being. Mm -hmm. You were mentioning kind of the role of, of, of governments and, uh, and sort of different types of political forces. We actually have two questions that I think are kind of connected with that. Um, one, I'm so I'll, I'll read, them, read them both because I think they'll come in together in some respects. Um, one is, can you talk about how global political forces have supported and threatened the achievement of the, the kind of 90-90-90 goals? And I think connected to that, uh, what do you see as the role of PEPFAR? Uh, in the history of HIV in, uh, in Africa, these kinds of different uh, kind of agendas. Right, um, that's, those are super interesting. And in fact, let me, you know, PEPFAR um, is, uh, is comes oh, I out I love of, that you come prepared with uh, slides ready to go for questions, there you go. Well, yeah, I just thought it's useful to, you know, to think about, um, you know, that, you know, PEPFAR came out of um, George George W. Bush's State of the Union address in in January of 2008, when he saw a tremendous opportunity to address um, AIDS in Africa, and so he proposed this emergency plan for AIDS relief, which has now become known known as PEPFAR. Um, and you know, this in in some ways is probably his most enduring legacy or positive legacy, and most important in, in terms of the amount of Re the resources that he committed to HIV. And part of this has to do with the historical context. After September 11th, 2001, reevaluating what global partnerships and instability in the world might mean on American shores, uh, people began to see the question of HIV and its effects on society, especially in African nations, where it kills people who are who are adults in the prime of their life because they're they are the ones who are sexually active, um, and and it kills it, it it cuts them down in the process of social reproduction. I mean, and in, in reproducing society and and family and family life, um, uh, and so you know PEPFAR stepped in and imagined AIDS to also be a security issue and was able to bring together a lot of a lot of um, a lot of forces and tremendous amount of resources to uh, to fight HIV um, and to treat and to roll out treatment broad broad treatment for HIV in all around the world, but particularly in in sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, so we see just the this is just showing how much you know just exactly how much money was was put into this. And so you know when we line up the efforts of the Global Fund of PEPFAR of UNAIDS. Um, we see we see a, a sort of multipolar world where um, the, some are, as I said, the interest of philanthropy. Some are an individual nation's interest, um, and and also then the, these international international bodies. So we can see the politics playing out there. Um, I was in Tanzania in 2017 af after um, Donald Trump had been elected president of the United States, and there was some talk that he would cut PEPFAR funding um, and. You know, many countries in Tanzania and Malawi, places I've been, depend extremely, I mean, they depend on PEPFAR money to make antiretroviral drugs possible. And the success that they've made in the, on the way to the 90-90-90 goals, Malawi is ahead of the United States on those goals, um, is due in part to the funding of antiretroviral drugs. So talking to a doctor in rural Tanzania, I, we asked him, well, what, what would happen if uh, this funding, if PEPFAR funding was, was cut? And he just he 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 just shook his head wistfully and said, "Many people will die, many people will die." Um, and so, you know, I think we can't underestimate the way to which the U.S. commitment to PEPFAR has saved millions of lives um, in around around the world. And so that's been that's been an incredible an incredible part of the story, uh, and one that we we shouldn't lose sight of um, in terms of the U.S. efforts in that in that direction. It's really a, a remarkable accomplishment, um, not to kind of take us necessarily in a negative direction, but one of the questions was sort of interested in hearing too a little bit about uh, are there political forces that are getting in the way? I mean, if PEPFAR, for example, is a great example uh, of, of a success story uh, in a lot of ways, are there political forces in the world that are, that are preventing uh, or, or impeding the opportunity to, to reach these 90-90 goals, 90-90-90 goals? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I think that we've we've all had a uh, a crash course in the politics of pandemics uh, and the way that the way that people have different interests in in what is what is what is playing out. 
Um, I think in, in part, we see that the tremendous amount of money attached to PEPFAR has, has meant that governments have, um, uh, in some cases, made great efforts to try to comply with, with, the, with those kind of goals. There are questions we could raise about uh, sovereignty and who gets, you know, again, who's making these, these decisions and those kind of things. Um, you know, the, the, I think it's an older example, but, you know, the, in, in South Africa, in the early 2000s, uh, Nelson Mandela's successor, Thabo Mbeki, was someone who denied that, that HIV caused AIDS. Um, and so his own, which, which um, was a, a sort of scientific stance, but also a political stance, um, and in, in part response to the, the tremendous challenge of confronting um, AIDS in South Africa um, and the impossibility at that time of being able to, or, or what he imagines the impossibility of being able to apply to supply antiretroviral drugs. Um, he backed down on that and antiretroviral drugs came to South Africa and have had a, have a had tremendous success. Um, so, you know, there are, there are, there is that, that um, there's that piece. The next frontier is going to be pre-exposure prophylaxis, right? Which has already been, people might've heard of Truvada, which is a pill that people who are in a high risk of exposure to HIV can take every day prophylactically to keep them, to keep them from getting it. Um, and this is available in, in the United States. It's being tested elsewhere. But the question is again, with intellectual property and the price of drugs, you know, is it, is it feasible to have that to, to people who are in high risk groups or vulnerable populations to HIV exposure to be able to, to do that. And so again, the politics of, of drug pricing and drug availability, how do we, um, how do we weigh um, the benefits to shareholders and the benefits to um, people who are potentially infected with HIV. These are economic questions and also political questions that have to be, that are being worked out and that people are, are, are debating. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and moral questions as well, I would think, uh, and, and very difficult ones uh, for humans to make decisions about. You just mentioned kind of South Africa. One of, uh, one of the people in the audience um, writes to us that, uh, um, uh, that she's been in Lesotho, Africa, uh, and, uh, and believes, uh, here I'll quote, I believe that I heard that for uh, how small this country is, they have one of the highest uh, AIDS rates per capita in the world. Uh, do you know what contributes to this and what is being done to hopefully reduce AIDS in Southern Africa? Uh, is a big part of the story in terms of the reduction, the antiretrovirals, or are there, there are other aspects of the story there? And what causes such a high, such a high rate in such small places? Right, this is, this is part of that. And, and so the, the question is exactly right, that, that um, among the highest rates in the world are Lesotho, which is a, a country that is surrounded on all sides by South Africa. And what used to be called Swaziland is now called Iswati. Ariswatini, um, which is also um, tucked in between South Africa and Mozambique. Uh, you know, the geeky 19th century historian of Africa would tell you, that's me, uh, would tell you that these are, um, these were independent kingdoms, which were, which managed to negotiate with the British to keep their independence rather than be enfolded into um, agglomerations of South Africa that became Union of South Africa and eventually independent South Africa. Um, yet they also were places that relied heavily on, um, or that the people from Lesotho and from um, Swaziland or the Swazi, the Swati Kingdom were um, migrant laborers into S Southern Africa, into South Africa for the mining sector in South Africa. So, um, in part, you know these these vectors that made you know the mines of South Africa producing gold and platinum um, uh, were some of the and, and diamonds, right? The De Beers Company. That, that found diamonds in South Africa, or marketed diamonds in South Africa, or helped, or the ones who helped you understand that diamonds are forever, and and launched a brilliant marketing campaign to make the diamond the stone for the engagement ring. Um, but the when that side of the story obscures the tremendous labor cost of, of mining and and the exploitative practices of recruiting mine labor, so as far away all throughout Southern Africa. But these same chains of recruitment of bringing people to live on compounds in Southern Africa were also means of transmission of disease. Tuberculosis in the 1920s, uh, when, when ill workers were sent home, sent home to die, those also became HIV in the 1980s and 1990s. Um, so these economies of Southern Africa, which relied on migrant labor, um, were also particularly susceptible to, to HIV. So that's, that's part of the story, along with other aspects of 
um, you know, medical medical systems and availability availability of drugs. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <coughs> Excuse me. We have a, we have a couple of questions about uh, some of the basics of the disease and also the kind of transmission into the United States. Um, let me give you kind of together. Uh, so the first is. Uh, we're asked if you're diagnosed with HIV, do, uh, will you always get uh, AIDS? Uh, and the second asks, um, what are your thoughts on, on Robert Rayford and how and when HIV entered the United States? So, so what about disease? Those, those are two great questions and, and, they, and, and they're the kind of things that historians love because they bring up the wrinkles and make us think about the contradictions and the way that the big story may, may not be the whole story. Right. And so part of it is, you know, if you get diagnosed with HIV, will will it progress to AIDS? The, you know, the short answer would be yes. The more complicated answer is not always. And it turns out that there are uh, they have discovered a small subset of people. Um, for instance, there are a group of sex workers in Nairobi who were having um, several, you know, who have over the course of a year, hundreds, if not thousands of exposures, potential exposures to HIV, who never developed, who never contracted HIV or who never progressed to AIDS. And so these people are called long-term elite controllers um, and people are trying to understand what are the genetic variations and other things that make it make it possible that, that there are some people who do not seem to be able to, who do not seem to, to get AIDS even if they have lots of exposures to HIV. Um, and that's, uh, again, a kind of wrinkle and that, that the scientists can tell you a lot more about it, but it's, it's interesting to keep in, in mind to think about the broad variation of, of the human genome and experience and, and how that might play out in various, in various settings. Um, so that, that is part of it. And then the question of Robert Rayford, who was a, a, teenager, in, um, a teenager in Missouri and, uh, they, and, and died of, mysteriously in the, in the late 1960s um, of diseases that it wasn't understood what was happening, but it was a complete collapse of his immune system. Again, it seems, and, and, and so, you know, 1981 is the date that people think about as understanding of HIV or, or what was in it was AIDS. But in fact, um, you know, there are these cases of, there's a Norwegian sailor who had been on the coast of West Africa uh, who, who died in an earlier period. There's a, a Belgian doctor who'd been in the Congo and, and had like potentially been exposed to died of an immune um, immune suppression disease. And so Robert Rayford is, is one of those, those cases would, you know, would suggest that HIV, that it seemed like what he had was HIV. Um, but if you, if you read, even reading the Wikipedia article, will let you know that the kind of understanding at the time was quite limited. And then what's happened since with the tissue samples and others have made it very difficult to confirm. Although I think the, there's a consensus that he did have HIV or some, something like HIV, but, but that was in 1969 in the American Midwest. Um, and not, a, you know, not a coastal, not a coastal, not a coastal city. Um, and so understanding his story um, and this and the stories of people like him who were, you know, potentially among the first people in the world, and you could do this in, in, in different countries, um, help us understand the complexity of the disease and also highlight some of the mysteries that we still don't understand and thinking about this global history. Mm -hmm. um... I'm hoping we can sneak in time for one more question. Uh, we've talked today a lot, which makes sense as an African history specialist about, uh, about Africa and the United States. Um, we do have a question here about uh, whether you can speak at all to kind of what's going on with HIV AIDS in, uh, in the Soviet Union and Eastern Bloc. Um, and you know, did they suppress the incidence of the disease? Did that lead to more infections? Um, yeah. Uh, that's a great question, and you know, one of the two of us in this conversation is a specialist on Russia and the Soviet Union, so uh, that's not me. But you, you might have some, you might have some things to add. <clears throat> My sense would be, uh, if there's a few interesting stories, and and that we can think about that as as AIDS played out in the 1980s, and in, in what we now see is the end of the Cold War. Though people didn't know that at the time, um, it became, you know, that the Soviet Union seized on it as a as a as a tool for propaganda. And in, in fact, um, planted stories uh, about um, AIDS and the way that it had spread and, and potentially being a, a CIA plot and other kinds of things to destabilize or to challenge American, um, American influence uh, around the world. Um, but the, the Soviet Union and then Russia, the governments have been, in my understanding, have been quite reticent in addressing, addressing AIDS. Um, we saw in, in, in Russian prisons, the explosion of um, 
extreme multi-drug resistant tuberculosis. Um, and tuberculosis and HIV often go hand in hand. So the same conditions that made the proliferation of tuberculosis across the former Soviet Union, uh, especially in prison settings, have also made it possible to have also spread HIV. Um, the societal stigma about men having sex with men uh, and the ability to talk about that or address that publicly, and, and the same way of dealing with uh, addiction, especially those addicted to um, injectable drugs um, and the criminalization of that uh, and the, the fact that people who are convicted of things are thrown into prison um, are, and, not, and not treated are contribute to those factors. So some of them are the very biological and medical factors that have helped spread HIV everywhere. And some of them are particular factors that, that deal with um, the, both the culture, the, you know, the political culture and, and social culture of these, of these countries and the political choices that, 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 that they've made. Um, but you know, as we live in a world where uh, HIV uh, is, or, or we have the tools to address HIV and reduce the numbers, um, but the, the places of growth of, of increasing HIV infections are in are in Eastern Europe and Russia, um, and so you know we have to think about tools and techniques and approaches that have been developed and have been quite successful in other parts of the world and have really um, you know suppressed a HIV um, in individuals, virally suppressed people in, in Southern Africa. How might we roll out those kinds of campaigns, or how might we adapt campaigns like that to make antiretrovirals? widely acceptable and accepted in places like Eastern Europe, where there is uh, an epidemic that continues to foment. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, I just actually put into the question and answer box, if, if anybody's interested, a, 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 a link to an, to an article on uh, the immediate response of the Soviet Union to uh, HIV AIDS and the way in which they simply tried to, 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 to deny its existence and to pretend it didn't. It couldn't possibly exist in their particular country, and, and the devastating consequences of that. Um, we'll send, uh, you know, uh, uh, after the uh, the webinar, we'll send a uh, an email on follow up email, which will have some extra kind of readings and other things that you can uh, explore if you would like. Um, the time always goes by so fast, uh, but uh, thank you all so very very much for joining us today and for your marvelous questions. Uh, I am grateful to Professor. Uh, uh, Thomas McDowell for sharing his expertise here today, and I hope you will all join me in giving him a, a virtual round of applause. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, thank you so much, and, and I would just say that I think one of the enduring legacies of HIV has to be the way that we approach people who are, who are ill and that have infectious diseases and the degree to which we stigmatize those populations. Um, when we make it hard to talk about those diseases and people's infections, we make it hard to treat them. We make it hard for societies to move past pandemics. Um, so I think they're important legacies that we keep in mind, even as we look back on World AIDS Day to remember those who have died and those who have suffered from this devastating disease. What a perfect way to end. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, thank you all for joining us again. Stay safe and stay healthy and uh, we'll see you all next time.